Why They Failed, weekly analysis of NMC Auskey results with nurse Adrian and your host Georgie. Hello and welcome to episode 35 of Why They Failed from IELTS Medical with me, your host Georgie and our nurse educator Adrian. Hello again Adrian, thank you so much for coming and talking to us today. Hello, Georgie, and thank you very much for having me again. Well, let's get started with our first example. So example number one for episode 35 comes from the implementation station. So let me share that with everybody now. The implementation station. The candidate failed to briefly acknowledge any possible contraindications and relevant medical information prior to administration. The nurse must provide a correct explanation to the patient so that the patient is an active participant in their treatment and is able to give informed consent to take the medication. The candidate failed to provide a correct explanation of what each drug being administered is for to the person in their care. The nurse failed to explain the indications for two medications administered, the, antispas the antispasmodic and the proton pump inhibitor. The nurse must provide a correct explanation to the patient so that the patient is an active participant in their treatment and is able to give informed consent to take the medication. To achieve safe administration of medication, the nurse must have sound knowledge of the therapeutic use. If a nurse lacks knowledge of a particular medication, they must not administer it and seek advice. The candidate fails to, before administering any prescribed drug, Look at the medicine containers and check that the name of the medication matches the medication on the person's prescription chart. In the induction to the station, the candidate was asked to verbalise what they were doing and why. It is important to complete all the required checks prior to administering medication in order to avoid medication errors. An electronic British National Formulary, BNF, is available in the station for the candidate to refer to. The candidate failed to record drug administration and non-administration as they ran out of time. The candidate failed to accurately document the details of the person, person administering medication on page two. The signature log was left blank. Signing and fully completing documentation for drug administration or non-administration is a legal requirement. What are your thoughts on this, Adrian? So as I say, nurse, and if it's not documented, it's not done. That's one of the golden rules that we live by. So in this case, it said that the nurse failed to provide a correct explanation of the to the patient so that the patient was an active participant in their treatment and able to give informed consent. In everything we do, we need to make sure that we involve the client, that the client understands what is being done and why it is being done so that they can consent to either it being done or not wanting to participate. Now, as it relates to the contraindications for medication, let's say, for example, you have an asthmatic client who's being prescribed NSAIDs. For most persons with asthma, they do have a hypersensitivity to non-steroidal non anti-inflammatory drugs, and so they try to avoid that. So being aware of what the contraindications are helps you to also protect the patient and make sure that you keep that client safe. So in this scenario, they did not give the patient enough information for which they could make that judgment to say, I actually want this medication or I can have it. They also said that they failed to provide correct explanation of what each drug that was being administered was for. Now, you can't just come and say, okay, here are two pills, take them. Clients need to know, okay, so pill A, this is, let's say, for example, it's an analgesic. Um, the name of the drug is paracetamol. It's being used to treat your pain or fever that you're being experienced. You're required to have this drug probably every four to six hours. Um, we also need to maybe assess your pain scale if, if that's the case, you're treating pain and the possible side effects from taking this medication are A, B, and C. Um, once you've done that to the client, say that um, it's contraindicated if, let's say, for example, if you were already on other pain medications or another um, formulation that had paracetamol in it, then you could not have an additional um, drug with paracetamol because you would exceed the maximum dose. So once you give the patient that information, then the patient is allowed then to weigh in that, okay, so this drug is going to do X, um, possible side effects from this drug or Y, 
and do I want to take this medication? Once you've provided them with that information, then they can say, okay, I want to have the medication, you're free to proceed. Now, apart from that, it also said that the nurse failed to explain the indications for the medications administered. One was an antispasmodic and one was a proton pump inhibitor. If you're not sure as to what the drug is, do not guess. You're, as it does state, you are provided with an elite electronic British National Formulary, or BNF as it's called, which gives you a list of all the drugs that are legally allowed within the United Kingdom. It tells you what that drug is, what the indication, what's the maximum dosage or what's the dosage range, who is it for, what is it used to treat for, what are the possible side effects, what are the adverse effects, um, and it gives a full list. So you can actually follow that so even if you didn't know what, let's say, um, the drug was being used for or what it is, you can or you should be referring to your BNF for assistance. In that way, it helps you to um, avoid errors like this from happening. Um, it said that the nurse must provide a correct explanation, which is true, because if I don't have a correct explanation of what the medication is for, what it's being used for, what it is actually, um, what are the possible side effects? then I can't give you informed consent. In order to achieve the safe administration, you must have safe knowledge of what the therapeutic use is for. Why am I giving this patient this particular medication at this particular time? Again, if you lack knowledge of the particular medication, do not, do not administer and you seek advice. This is not only for your exam, but this is also when you're actually in practice. There are some drugs that we might not be familiar with, which might not be common to our practice. If you do come across those and you aren't sure exactly what it's being used for, how it's supposed to be administered, the route that's being um, written for it to be administered is unfamiliar to you, please, you, you can ask your colleague, you have sister or nurse in charge that you can also refer to. You can also contact the prescribing um, physician to ask them, okay, this drug was prescribed. Do you mind helping me what the indication is? If it's not there, you can check your BNF. Make sure you cover your bases and check what it is that you're given, why it is you're given it, where it is you're given it, whom it is you need to give it to as well. And is it the right time for you to be given that medication? Make sure you follow your, your rights. I know that for some persons, the rights can go all the way up to 10, but you need to actually, actually make sure you cover your five basic rights. Is it the right patient? Is it the right drug? Is it the right dose? Is it the right time? And is it being given via the right route? Once you've covered those five, then you can ensure that the medication then would be safe for you to proceed and give. Now, it said here also that the candidate had failed to, before administering any prescribed drug, look at the medicine containers and check that the name of the medication matches that of the prescription chart that you are following. You may have a situation on a unit, two clients that have the same or similar names. You need to make sure that the drug is, that you're given is meant to be given to Bob Black and not Bob White, or that if you have two Bob Whites, that it's the right Bob White that you're giving it to um, in terms of cross-referencing with the date of birth. That's why ID checks are very important when it comes to administration of medication. You do your check before you go off to get your medication, and then you do your checks also again before you administer. So with these checks, you also need to make sure that you've got the right medicine for the right patient. Um, if it does not match, then you should not give. Uh, it also said that at the induction, um, the client was asked, well, the student was asked to verbalize what they were doing and why. So if it is that you're coming here, say 12 o'clock noon, hi, good day, Mr. Bob White. My name is um, Adrian. I'm going to be nurse administering your prescribed medication today. And you indicate that, okay, so today I, you go through your MAR chart. I have drug X, which is your um, antispasmodic. This drug is being used or given to you for muscle spasms that you might be having or, or particular type of pain. Um, then also your proton pump inhibitor. 
which helps in terms of reducing the, the gastric acid secretions, um, which could cause things like your heartburn. So that is why this drug is being used. Or it could be that this drug is being used um, as a prophylaxis in terms of this particular antispasmodic might be very harsh on your stomach. So in order to protect it, you need to use this particular drug. You only know this if you check your BNF and you look at the particular drug that is being administered. There is no harm in checking. As it says, it is important for you to complete all checks prior to administering. So when you go, you introduce yourself and make sure that you're with the right client. You don't want to be sharing my information with another client or, or vice versa. And then also you want to make sure that when you're dealing with the administration of medicine, you giving it, you're giving it to the right client that it has been prescribed for. It might be a client who might be on insulin. His name is Bob P. The other person's name is also Bob P. Bob P number two is not a diabetic. Bob P number one is diabetic. He's been prescribed insulin to be given. Subcutaneous, you accidentally end up with Bob P number two. You go to him, you didn't check, you administer your insulin, and then you have a, a serious incident on your hand. So your checks are very, very, very important not only for the client, but also for the drug. You need to make sure it's not expired. Um, if it's a liquid, um, it doesn't have any sediments in it, it's not crystallized. All these things we need to be checking for just to make sure we have a safe product to be administered safely to the client. Uh, it also said that the client had, the candidate, sorry, had failed to record the drug administration and non-administration because they ran out of time. Again, in these stations, time management is required. Try to avoid using fillers like um, uh, uh, these eat your time. Keep practicing what it is that you want to say. Um, go through the examples that you would have been provided with. Once you keep practicing, when you, you come to that particular station, it builds your confidence. So you aren't nervous in terms of interacting with the um, machinery or items that would have been provided for the station. Um, also in terms of with your drugs, interact with your BNF, make sure you know what your drug is for, the potential side effects. If there's anything you don't know about it, have a quick look at it. There's no penalty for doing that. Once you've managed your time, then again, you'll have time to give your patient education as required with your stations. Um, and just keep practicing. That's, that's the most thing that we can do. As I did start off by saying is that if it's not signed or if it's not documented, it means it's not done. Because they might have run out of time, it means that they did not sign the area, which can lead to further drug errors, which means that a drug could be administered twice because there was no signature. Or it could mean that the drug might have been omitted. We do not know. And that can also have severe effects upon the client especially if it's a drug like insulin that was required to help regulate the person's blood sugar or blood glucose levels. Sign in, make sure we sign. If it requires you to date, you sign and date. Make sure it's completely done and in the spaces required. It is a legal requirement to make sure that you sign for all drugs that have been given and those that aren't given. And that is so that we avoid drug administration errors or re-administration of the same drug. So again here, make sure you do your relevant safety checks, patient IDs, check your drug trolley, check the drugs that are in there, cross-reference it with the identification or the addresser graph that's on your medication administration record, check the medication in your trolley. Once you've done all your checks and you're convinced that this is um, safe to administer, you go through the process. When you come back to the patient's bedside, make sure you do those checks again. And once you confirm the identity, then you proceed. Always make sure that you also check for any allergies prior to starting the station. You also check for any allergies again before administering because the client might have forgotten something or you might not have asked it initially. And in that way, you avoid the administration of a drug that the client might have had a reaction to or the client might be allergic to. And it makes the process safe. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Adrian. That was really uh, comprehensive. Thank you. Revising for your NMC CBT. Is your NMC CBT exam date approaching fast? 
then your vision is incomplete without the NMC CBT Complete Video Course. Written by a senior UK registered clinical nurse educator and an experienced NMC CBT tutor. The NMC CBT Complete Video Course includes easy to follow CBT courses focusing on the exact areas you need in order to pass your NMC CBT in one attempt. It also includes tips and tricks for the CBT exam, as well as tried and tested CBT materials and individual progress reports. Plus, our CBT nurses also receive 30-day access to a complete NMC CBT mock examination. Learn more at www.cbtnurses.com. The first module of the course is free. Okay, our next example is from the evaluation station. The candidate noted the patient's previous medical history and relevant social history, but failed to mention the relevant medication. The candidate failed to state the main nursing care needs of the patient. The patient was pre-operative and the candidate failed to state what was required of the nurse receiving the patient on the next shift. Complete and accurate communication in accordance with the Nursing and Midwifery Council standards is necessary to ensure clear communication between healthcare professionals. In preparation for the re resit, the marking criteria, equipment list and reading list are on the test centre's web page. Okay, there we are. So, in the evaluation station, we always um, encourage students to use the SBAR approach, situation background assessment and recommendation. What we also do is do the IS bar, which is introduce self, introduce patient, and then you go through your S bar format. In this particular scenario, it says that, yes, they did accurately or present the patient's previous medical history, which is important, the relevant social history. But if you don't tell me what medication this patient was on, then it means then that I don't have a full picture of what's going on. And then the handover becomes ineffective. It is important that you note any medication the client was taking prior to being admitted. So if the person was on um, a drug prior to, to admission, identify what drug is, the dose, what it was being used for. That becomes effective in the handover so that I know going forward that this client might need to be prescribed this particular medication or they was prescribed it or that they're taking it regularly. Um, it did state that the client was a pre-op patient. So we know that if the client was pre-op, you'll be looking at things like your CNLs as your acronym that you'll be going with. Make sure that you identify what are all the areas that you would have checked. Um, if there's consent, identification, if they've been nailed by mouth, if um, all the accessories have been removed, um, if we've got the lab works, if they've got the anti-embolic stockings, things like that. Um, we make sure that the client would have been prepped um, correctly. As it did state, uh, they failed to state what was required of the nurse receiving. So again, if I'm taking over from you, you don't give me clear instructions as to what I need to do, then it means that the care that I provide will be ineffective or it might be inaccurate and it can cause the patient then to have harm or come to harm and that's not what we're here for we're here to help our clients along make sure we keep them safe move them from a, a state of being in ill health to maybe optimum health as best as possible and sometimes that requires this handover and ineffective or poor handover means that the care being passed on will be ineffective as well and then the patient will more than likely come to harm as a result so um, we need to make sure that the communication between us as health professionals remains clear. That is a necessary standard as set out by the Nursing and Midwifery Council. We need to adhere to that as um, clinicians going forward. The marking criteria and equipment lists are always provided by the testing centers on the web page in terms of what is required. So we just need to recap what will be there, what we need to hand over in your evaluation station. You will have your equipment from, well, your paperwork from your assessment station, your planning station, as well as your implementation. So that information is there to help guide you through your handover. 
I suggest that you spend at least the first two minutes just noting what it is you're going to be handing over and then spend the additional five minutes or so to effectively hand over what is required for the safe treatment of this particular patient. Wonderful. Thank you so much for explaining. Okay, and our last example today is from the fluid balance station. The candidate fails to accurately transpose the information onto the fluid balance chart and failed to complete the fluid intake balance accurately. The candidate did not accurately transpose the fluid intake. This resulted in an inaccurate calculation and documentation of the total input and total balance of the patient. The candidate failed to accurately transpose the information onto the fluid balance chart and failed to complete the fluid output balance accurately. The candidate did not accurately transpose the output fluid balance. This resulted in an inaccurate calculation and documentation of the total output and total balance of the patient. Failing to accurately complete and document the fluid balance for a patient may result in the patient receiving an incorrect fluid regime for their clinical condition. Correct fluid balance documentation and monitoring is essential to avoid fluid overload or dehydration in the patient and to ensure that the patient receives the correct care and treatment. The candidate failed to calculate and document the total fluid balance accurately. Failing to accurately complete and document the fluid balance for a patient may result in the patient receiving an incorrect fluid regime for their clinical condition. Correct fluid balance monitoring is essential to avoid fluid overload or dehydration in the patient and to ensure that the patient receives the correct care and treatment. Over to you, Adrian. So fluid balance is one of those stations where we need to pay attention to the information that's given and where we put it, and then also how we calculate it. Now for the fluid balance, I know that many persons, there, there are usually two approaches in terms of when we're inputting stuff. Some persons go through the school of taking everything forward. So anything that's given after the hour, you take forward into the next hour. Some persons account for that particular fluid in the hour in which it was done. So say, for example, you had 150 mils of water being given at 9.20 in the morning. Some persons would chart that as under the 0900, and others would take that forward to the 1000 hour slot. Now note, neither way is incorrect, but there must be consistency. So if you have fluids being given at 9.20, fluids being given at 10.15, fluids being given at 13.30 and you're the person that's accounting for them at the hour prior so let so that would be at nine o'clock ten o'clock and at three o'clock once you do that consistently that's fine if you're the person that's taking it forward you go to so the 9 15 goes to 10 o'clock the 10 o'clock um fluid that was given goes to 11 and the one at 3 30 then goes to um 1600 which is four o'clock once you are consistent with that, then that is not a problem. When you transpose your information, make sure you put it correctly. So whether it's um, parenteral, whether it's um, enteral that's going being inputted, make sure you put it in the correct column. Uh, with your fluid balance, you have your hourly totals. So that's the total amount of fluid that was given in the hour. And then you have your overall total input which is a cumulative input that adds to the previous um, total that was there. So if you give fluids at nine o'clock, whatever the total fluids for nine o'clock is, then you add the total that was given during the 10 o'clock slot to that and move forward. So you need to be consistent with that. Um, it did say that they failed to accurately transpose the information. Of course, that's a serious problem. If um, the input being put in and also the output being charted is incorrectly, client can either end up with a positive um, fluid balance or a negative fluid balance, which is a deficit, which means that the treating team can then either, um, will then more than likely implement the inappropriate um, treatment for that client, which can then result in harm. And this is especially uh, important when you have clients that have high risk of fluid overload. So um, patient might be having congestive cardiac failure, 
and you need to make sure that you don't overwork like, the heart muscle more than is required. So you need to make sure that you have an accurate input and an accurate output being recorded. So it then said the same thing goes for your output field. If it is urine, if it is a bowel movement, it needs to be charted on the sheet. And you need to make sure that you chart those amounts appropriately, even if it is vomit, then that also needs to be accounted for. And you need to put the volume as well. Again, you do your hourly um, totals, but then you also do your cumulative total, which is the final column to the far side of your output. And that adds all the way down to the final output um, entry. So again, once the transposing is incorrect, it means that you have incorrect calculation and documentation of the total output. And so therefore your total balance of the patient will be wrong. Again, failing to accurately complete and document this may result, it says may result, but it does put that patient at significant risk because Again, if you're dealing with the CCF patient or CHF, as they call it, congestive heart failure client, and you've calculated that this client has a positive fluid balance, which might not be the case, then it might mean that you might underload or dehydrate the patient, or the case could be in the result, the patient might have a neg uh, negative and you end up overloading the patient with too much fluid. So we need to be sure and be careful that when we're transposing and calculating that our calculations are accurately and they're given um, place in the correct time and the totals for that time are also calculated accurately. It went on to say that the candidate failed to calculate and document the total fluid balance accurately. Again, that is important. You need to make sure you complete all your areas, total input, total output. In order to get a fluid balance, it is your input subtracted from your, well, your output, or your output subtracted from your input, yes. So you have your input minus your output, and that gives what the balance is. Then you would indicate whether it's a positive or a negative balance, and then that would then inform the clinicians as to what approach you need to do. Do I need to increase the fluids or do I need to decrease the fluids for this particular patient? And as such, the interventions then would be appropriate. If you've given the wrong outcome or wrong um, balance, then it puts that client's life or treatment at risk. Great, thank you for explaining that. That's really useful, I'm sure. Okay, well, that takes us to the end of another episode of why they failed. So thank you very much to everybody at home listening and watching. Uh, we really hope this podcast is helping you. We hope it's reminding you of things that you may have forgotten. And remember to like and subscribe so that you don't miss an episode. Thank you very much, Adrian. We'll see you soon. Thank you again. See you soon. Bye. Bye.